From a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereux. Fortification, part two. Romans playing cards. This is the second part of a five-part series covering some of the basics of fortifications, from city walls to field fortifications from the ancient world through the modern period. Last time, we looked at the ancient besiegers' playbook, both the motives and options for taking walled cities, through a case study of Assyrian siege methods. This time, we're going to move forward several centuries to look at Roman fortifications, in particular how Roman methods of fortification changed to meet different objectives within different strategic environments. A good example of how what one is trying to do with a fortification alters the form that the fortification takes. The Romans were, of course, building fortification for a very long time. We're going to start with Roman fortified camps no later than the 2nd century BC, probably also in use in the 3rd century, and march all the way forward to Roman legionary fortresses in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, focusing on the ways that the changing strategic environment alters the overall aims of these fortifications, which in turn influences their physical structure, but within a pre-existing framework established by past practice and assumptions. As always, if you like what you are reading here, please share it. If you really like it, you can support me on Patreon. And if you want updates whenever a new post appears, you can click below for email updates or Follow me on Twitter at Brett Devereaux for updates as to new posts, as well as my occasional ancient history, foreign policy, or military history musings. Ace of Spades Now, when we talk about the evolution of Roman forts, it is important to be clear that the Romans and their Mediterranean contemporaries already had a well-developed tradition of city fortification and we'll look at perhaps the greatest example of that tradition at the beginning of next week. Sophisticated walled cities in the Hellenistic period, 323 to 31 BC, typically a stone curtain wall running the perimeter of the city, much like the one at Jericho. These could be very substantial. The 4th century BC walls of Rome were up to 10 meters high and 3.5 meters thick, made out of tuffa supported by projecting towers that might mount not only archers, but also catapults, and be further defended by a combination of defensive ditches and outwalls. So, the Romans have access, filtering in through these successor states. The Romans were voracious adapters of foreign military technology to all of those techniques already. So the decision in some cases to not use them is a conscious choice. Although, in some cases, the reason for that choice may well be tradition and inertia. But we're not going to start with Roman city walls, but rather with Roman marching forts. The degree to which we should understand the Roman habit of constructing fortified marching camps every night as exceptional is actually itself an interesting question. Our sources disagree on the origins of the Roman fortified camp. Frontinus, Frontinus, Stratagems, Book 4, Chapter 1, Section 15, says that the Romans learned it from the Macedonians, by way of Pyrrhus of Epirus. But Plutarch, Plutarch, Life of Pyrrhus, Book 16, Chapter 4, represents it the other way around. Livy, more reliable than either, agrees with Frontinus that Pyrrhus is the origin point. Livy, Book 15, Chapter 14, Section 8, but also has Philip V, a capable Macedonian commander, stand in awe of Roman camps. Livy, Book 31, Chapter 34, Section 8. It's clear there was something exceptional about the Roman camps, because so many of our sources treat it as such. Livy, Book 31, Chapter 34, Section 8, Polybius, Book 18, Chapter 24, Josephus, The Jewish War, Book 3, Chapters 70 and 98. Certainly the Macedonians regularly fortified their camps. For example, Polybius, Book 18, Chapter 24. Livy, Book 32, Chapter 5, Sections 11 to 13. Arian, Anabasis of Alexander, Book 3, Chapter 9, Section 1. 
Book 4, Chapter 29, Sections 1 to 3. Curtius, Book 4, Chapter 12, Sections 2 to 24. Book 5, Chapter 5, Section 1. Though, Carthaginian armies seem to have done this less often. For example, Polybius, Book 6, Chapter 42, Sections 1 to 2, in camping on open ground, is treated as a bold new strategy. It is probably not the camps themselves, but their structure, which was exceptional. Polybius claims Greeks, quote, shirk the labor of entrenching, end quote. Polybius, Book 6, Chapter 42, Sections 1 to 2 and notes that the stakes the Romans used to construct the wooden palisade wall of the camp are more densely placed and harder to remove. Polybius, Book 18, Chapter 18, Sections 5 to 18. The other clear difference Polybius notes is the order of Roman camps, that the Romans lay out their camp the same way wherever it is, whereas Greek and Macedonian practice was to conform the camp to the terrain. Polybius, Book 6, Chapter 42. The archaeology of Roman camps bears out the former, whereas analysis of likely battlefield sites, like the Battle of Aus, seem to bear out the latter. In any case, the mostly standard layout of Roman marching camps, which in the event the Romans lay siege become siege camps, enables us to talk about the Roman marching camp, because as far as we can tell, they were all quite similar, not merely because Polybius says this, but because the basic features of these camps really do seem to stay more or less constant. Note 1. Please do note, not entirely constant. Changes in the organizational structure of the legions are reflected in the structure of the camp. For more on this, and Roman camps in general, check out M. Dobson, the Army of the Roman Republic, the 2nd century BC, Polybius and the camps at Numantia, Spain, 2008. And while Polybius insists that Roman camps never bow to the terrain, they clearly do sometimes. So they aren't perfectly consistent, but they are remarkably consistent. End of note 1. Image. Diagram of a Roman marching camp. Image description. Via Wikipedia, a diagram of the fairly standard layout of a Roman marching camp. The original caption goes thusly. Basic ideal plan of a Roman castrum. 1. Principia. 2. Via Praetoria. 3. Via Principalis. 4. Porta Principalis Dextra. 5. Porta Praetoria, main gate. 6. Porta Principalis Sinistra. 7. Porta Decumana, back gate. End of image description. The basic outline of the camp is a large rectangle with the corners rounded off, which has given the camps, and later forts derived from them, their nickname, playing card forts. The size and portions of a fortified camp would depend on the number of legions, allies, and auxiliaries present, from nearly square to having one side substantially longer than the other. This isn't the place to get into the internal configuration of the camp, except to note that these camps seem to have been standardized so that the layout was familiar to any soldier wherever they went, which must have aided in both building the camp, since issues of layout would become habit quickly, and packing it up again. Now, a fortified camp does not have the same defensive purpose as a walled city, the latter is intended to resist a siege, while a fortified camp is mostly intended to prevent an army from being surprised and to allow it the opportunity to either form for battle or safely refuse battle. That means the defenses are mostly about preventing stealthy approach, slowing down attackers, and providing a modest advantage to defenders with a relative economy of cost and effort. In the Roman case, for a completed defense, the outermost defense was the fossa, or ditch. Sources differ on the normal width and depth of the ditch. It must have differed based on local security conditions. But as a rule, they were at least three feet and five feet wide, often significantly more than this. Actual measured Roman defensive fossae 
are generally rather wider, typically with a 2 to 1 ratio of width to depth, as noted by Kate Gilliver. The earth excavated to make the fossa was then piled inside of it to make a raised earthwork rampart the Romans called the agare. Finally, on top of the agare, the Romans would place the vali, stakes, they carried to make the volum. Volum gives us our English word, wall, but more nearly means palisade or rampart. The Latin word for a stone wall is more often murus. Polybius, Book 18, Chapter 18, notes that Greek camps often used stakes that hadn't had the side branches removed and spaced them out a bit, perhaps a foot or so, too closely set for anyone to slip through. This sort of spaced out palisade is a common sort of anti-ambush defense, and we know of similar village fortifications in pre- and early post-contact North America on the East Coast, used to discourage raids. Obviously, the downside is that when such stakes are spaced out, it only takes the removal of a few to generate a breach. The Roman volume, by contrast, set the volley fixed close together, with the branches interlaced and with the tips sharpened, making them difficult to climb or remove quickly. The gateway obviously could not have the ditch cut across the entryway, so instead, a second ditch, the titulum, was dug six feet or so in front of the gate to prevent direct approach. The gate might also be reinforced with a secondary arc of earthworks, either internally or externally, called the clavicula. The goal of all of this extra protection was, again, not to prevent a determined attacker from reaching the gates, but rather to slow a surprise attack down to give the defender time to form up and respond. And that's what I want to highlight about the nature of the fortified Roman camp. This isn't a defense meant to outlast a siege, but, as I hinted at last time, a defense meant to withstand a raid. At most, a camp might need to withstand the enemy for a day or two, providing the army inside the opportunity to retreat during the night. We actually have some evidence of similar sort of stake wall protections in use on the east coast of native North America in the 16th century, which featured a circular stake wall with a baffle gate that prevented a direct approach and entrance. The warfare style of the region was heavily focused on raids rather than battles or sieges, though the former did happen in what is sometimes termed the cutting off way of war. On this, see W. Lee, The Military Revolution of Native North America in Empires and Indigenes, editor W. Lee, 2011. Interestingly, this form of Native American fortification seems to have been substantially disrupted by the arrival of steel axes for, presumably, exactly the reasons that Polybius discusses when thinking about Greek versus Roman stake walls. Pulling up a well-made, read, Roman stake wall was quite difficult. However, with steel axes imported from European traders, Native American raiding forces could quickly cut through a basic palisade. Interestingly, in the period that follows Lee, original citation, notes a drift towards some of the same methods of fortification the Romans used. Fortifications begin to square off, often combined a ditch with the palisade, and eventually incorporated corner bastions projecting out of the wall, a feature Roman camps do not have, but later Roman forts eventually will, as we'll see. Image, illustration of the native North American village of Pomiak. Image description, illustration in 1585 by John White of the native North American village of Pomiak in modern North Carolina. Note the wood stake palisade, with short intervals between the stakes. The Roman volum seems to be much more densely set than this, but one wonders if this style of fortification approximates how a Greek or Macedonian camp might be defended. End of image description. Roman field camps could be more elaborate than what I've described. Camps often featured, for instance, observation towers. These would have been made of wood, 
and seemed to have chiefly been elevated posts for lookouts rather than firing positions, given that they sit behind the volum rather than projecting out of it, meaning that it would be very difficult to shoot any enemy who actually made it to the volum from the tower. Image. Aerial photograph of the remains of a Roman fort. Image description. Via Wikipedia, remains of one of the Roman forts used in the siege of Masada, 72-3 AD, still showing the distinctive playing card shape. End of image description. When a Roman army laid siege to a fortified settlement, the camp formed the base from which siege works were constructed, particularly circumvallation, making a wall around the enemy's city to keep them in, and contravallation, making a wall around your siege position to keep other enemies out. We'll discuss these terms in more depth a little later. Some of the most elaborate such works we have described are Caesar's fortifications at the Siege of Elysia, 52 BC. Caesar, Gaelic War, Book 7, Chapter 72. There, the Roman line consisted of an initial trench well beyond bowshot range from his planned works in order to prevent the enemy from disrupting his soldiers with sudden attacks. Then an Agaran volum constructed with a parapet to allow firing positions from atop the volum, with observation towers every 80 feet and two ditches directly in front of the Agar, making for three defensive ditches in total. Be still, Roel Dyke's heart. But seriously, the point he makes on those insider expert rates videos about the importance of ditches are, as you can tell already, entirely accurate. Which were reinforced with sharpened stakes faced outward. As Caesar expressly notes, these weren't meant to be prohibitive defenses that would withstand any attack. Wooden walls can be chopped or burned, after all, but rather to give him time to respond to any effort by the defenders to break out, or by attackers to break in. He also contravallates, reproducing all of these defenses facing outward as well. Deciding to Stand The end of the reign of Augustus in 14 AD is a convenient marker for a shift in Roman strategic aims away from expansion and towards a frontier maintenance. The usual term for both the Roman frontier and the system of fortifications and garrisons which defended it is the limis, although this wasn't the only word the Romans applied to it. I want to leave aside for a moment the endless, complex conversation about the degree to which the Romans can actually be said to have strategic aims, though for what it is worth, I am one of those who contends that they did. Note 2. One of these days I may get around to writing about the debate. In the meantime, for a quick primer on it, look up J. E. Linden, Primitivism and Ancient Foreign Relations. C.J., Volume 87, Issue 4, 2002, pages 375 to 384. For a long primer on it, there is little substitute for E. L. Willer, Methodological Limits, and the Mirage of Roman Strategy. J. M. H., Volume 57, Issue 1, 1993, pages 7 to 41. And Volume 52, Issue 2, 1993, pages 215 to 240. End of Note 2. We're mostly interested here in Roman behavior on the frontiers, rather than their intent, anyway. Image. Model of the Roman Fortress Deva Victrix. Image Description. Via Wikipedia, a useful model of the Roman legionary fortress, Deva Victrix, at what is today Chester, England. The stone-walled fort here was constructed by Legio XX, Valeria Victrix, beginning in 88 AD. This particular fort would have supported Hadrian's Wall, and also projected power into modern Wales but is itself a bit more than a hundred miles away from the former. Note also both the retention of the playing card shape, but also how the towers do not project out from the wall, leaving no way to fire on enemies standing at the base of the wall. 
End of image description. What absolutely does begin to happen during the reign of Augustus and subsequently is that the Roman legions, which had spent the previous three centuries on the move outside of Italy, begin to settle down more permanently on Rome's new frontiers, particularly along the Rhine-Danube frontier facing Central and Eastern Europe, and the Syrian frontier facing the Parthian Empire. That in turn meant that Roman legions and their supporting auxiliary cohorts now settled into permanent forts. Note 3. The formulation here and the thinking in terms of what the various elements of the Roman system were intended to accomplish goes back to E.N. Lutwak's The Grand Strategy of the Roman Empire, 1976, the book that initiated the long-running strategy debate mentioned above. It is not without its own problems, and again, I direct you to the two articles in the previous note to read about that. Nevertheless, as an overview of the Roman frontier defense system, I think the basic description that follows holds up. The main debate is less about the structure of the system and more about the intent of it in any event. End of note 3. Image The Roman Fort of Akiniacum. Image description Via Wikipedia a diagram of a fairly standard, imperial period, Roman fort, with its standard playing card shape. While the Roman word for these camps was castra, which gives our word castle, describing this as a castle, as the caption does, mistakes its purpose. End of image description. The forts themselves, at least in the first two centuries, provide a fairly remarkable example of institutional inertia. While legionary forts of this early period typically replaced the earthwork and stakes wall, the agar and volum, with stone walls and towers and the tents of the camp with permanent barracks, the basic form of the fort, its playing card shape, encircling defensive ditches, now very often two or three ditches in sequence, remain. Of particular note, these early imperial legionary forts generally still feature towers which do not project outward from the wall, a stone version of the observation towers of the old Roman marching camp. Precisely because these fortifications are in stone, they are often very archaeologically visible, and so we have a fairly good sense of Roman forts in this period. In short then, put in permanent positions, Roman armies first constructed permanent versions of their temporary marching camp. And that broadly seems to fit with how the Romans expected to fight their wars on these frontiers. The general superiority of Roman arms in pitched battle, the fancy term here is escalation dominance, that escalating to large-scale warfare favored the heavier Roman armies, meant that the Romans typically planned to meet enemy armies in battle, not sit back to withstand sieges. This was less true on Rome's eastern frontier, since the Parthians were peer competitors, who could rumble with the Romans on more or less even terms. Note 4. The Romans win those rumbles more often than they lose, but it is hardly a one-sided affair. End of note 4. It is striking that the major centers in the east, like Jerusalem or Antioch, did not get rid of their city walls, whereas by contrast, the breakdown of Roman order in the 3rd century AD and subsequently leads to a flurry of wall building in the west, where it is clear many cities had neglected their defensive walls for quite a long time. Consequently, the legionary forts are more bases than fortresses, and so their fortifications are still designed to resist sudden raids, not large-scale sieges. Image, Map of Roman Limes in Germania Superior and Retia. Image Description Via Wikipedia, a map of the Roman Limes in Germania Superior and Retia, an area known to the Romans as the Agri Decumates. Notice how the major legionary bases at Trier, Mainz, Strasbourg, and Vendonissa are well behind the frontier itself, but positioned on clear road networks, which allow them to rapidly concentrate 
and respond to any incursion. End of image description. They were also now designed to support much larger fortification systems, which now gives us a chance to talk about a different kind of fortification network, border walls. The most famous of these Roman walls, of course, is Hadrian's Wall, a mostly, but not entirely, stone wall which cuts across northern England, built starting in 122. Hadrian's Wall is unusual in being substantially made out of stone, but it was of a piece with the various Roman frontier fortification systems. Crucially, the purpose of this wall, and this is a trait it shares with China's Great Wall, was never to actually prevent movement over the border or to block large-scale assaults. Taking Hadrian's Wall, it was generally manned by something around three legions, notionally. Often, at least one of the legions in Britain was deployed further south. Even with auxiliary troops nowhere near enough to actually manage a thick defense along the entire wall, Instead, the wall's purpose is slowing down hostile groups and channeling non-hostile groups, merchants, migrants, traders, travelers, towards controlled points of entry. Valuable especially because import-export taxes were a key source of state revenue, while also allowing the soldiers on the wall good observation positions to see these moving groups. You can tell the defense here wasn't prohibitive, in part because the main legionary fortresses aren't generally on the wall, but rather further south, often substantially further south, which makes a lot of sense if the plan is to have enemies slowed but not stopped by the wall, while news of their approach outraces them to those legionary forts so that the legions can form up and meet those incursions in an open battle after they have breached the wall itself. Remember, the Romans expect, and get, a very, very high success rate in open battles, so it makes sense to try to force that kind of confrontation. This emphasis on controlling and channeling, rather than prohibiting entry, is even more visible in the Roman frontier defenses in North Africa and on the Rhine-Danube frontier, in North Africa, the frontier defense system was structured around watch posts and the Fossatum Africae, a network of ditches, fossa, separating the province of Africa, mostly modern-day Tunisia, from non-Roman territory to its south. It isn't a single ditch, but rather a system of at least four major segments, and possibly more, with watchtowers and smaller forts in a line-of-sight network, so they can communicate. The ditch itself varies in width and depth, but typically not much more than 6 meters wide and 3 meters deep. Such an obstruction is obviously not a prohibitive defense, but the difficulty of crossing is going to tend to channel travelers and raids to the intentional crossings, or alternately slow them down as they have to navigate the ditch. A real problem here where raiders are likely to be mounted and so need to get their horses and or camels across. On the Rhine and the Danube, the defense of the Limes, the Roman frontier, included a border wall, earthwork and wood, rather than stone, like Hadrian's Wall, similarly supported by legions stationed to the rear, with road networks positioned. Once again, the focus is on observing threats, slowing them down and channeling them, so that the legions can engage them in the field. This is a system based around observe, channel, respond, rather than an effort to block advances completely. Refusing to fold. As we move into the later Roman Empire, particularly after the crisis of the third century, 235 to 284 AD, we start to see changes in the form of Roman forts. Two things had been happening over the course of the crisis, and in some cases before it, which transformed the Roman frontier situation. First, Rome's enemies had gotten quite a bit stronger. In the West, long exposure to Rome 
had led the various barbarians on the other side of the Limes to both pick up elements of Roman military practice, but also to form into larger and larger political units, in part in order to hold off Roman influence, which were more dangerous. In the east, the Parthian Empire had collapsed in 224 to be replaced by the far more capable and dangerous Sassanid Empire. At the same time, 50 years of civil war had left Rome itself economically and militarily weaker than it had been. Bigger threats, combined with scarcer state resources, enforced a more flexible approach to controlling the borders. In particular, Roman forces could no longer be entirely sure they would possess escalation dominance in any given theater. Indeed, during the crisis, with legions being peeled to fight endless internal wars between rival claimants, had meant that major frontier problems might go under-resourced or even entirely unaddressed for years. While the reign of Diocletian, 284 to 311, marked a return to Roman unity, quite a bit of damage had already been done, and by the end of the third century, we see changes in patterns of fortification that reflect that. The changes seem fairly clearly to have been evolutionary, in part because many older legionary forts remained in use. Some of the first things we see are traditional playing card forts, but now with the neat rectangular shape disrupted by having the towers project out from the walls. The value of a projecting tower, as we'll discuss more in the next part, is that soldiers on the tower, because it projects outward, can direct missiles, arrows, javelins, slings, etc., down the length of the wall, engaging enemies who might be trying to scale the wall or breach it. Of course, a fortress that is now being designed to resist enemies scaling or breaching large stone walls is no longer worried about a raid, but rather being designed to potentially withstand a serious assault or even a siege. Defensive ditches also multiply in this period and increase in length, often exceeding 25 feet in width and flat-bottomed. The design consideration here is probably not to stop a quick raid anymore, but to create an obstacle to an enemy moving rams or towers. Think back to our Assyrians, close to the walls. Image. Photo of the remains of the Roman fortress at Capadava. Image description. From the Program Interreg VA Romania Bulgaria 2014 to 2020, an aerial photograph of the remains of the Roman legionary fortress at Capadava on the Danube in what is today Romania, who I very much hope, since their objective is, quote, the development, enhancement, and innovation of the tourism product of the common Roman heritage, end quote, will not much mind me reproducing their photograph of this shockingly well-preserved Roman fort that I now very much want to visit. This is a great example where what was initially a Roman playing card legionary fort has been overbuilt with thickened walls and projecting towers. Note how the square towers at the center of the walls were originally gatehouses, which have been converted into projecting defense towers to leave fewer points of entry to defend. End of image description. Over time, forts also tended to abandon the playing card proportions and instead favor circular or square shapes, minimizing perimeter to defend for a given internal area. And while even the original Roman marching camps had been designed with the concern to make it hard for an enemy to fire missiles into the camp, using the trench to keep them out of range and keeping an interval, literally the intervallum, the inside the wall, between the volum and the buildings, so that any arrows or javelins sent over the walls would land in this empty space. Later Roman fortresses intensify these measures. We even see fortresses, like the one at Visegrad, shown below, incorporate its internal structures into the walls themselves, a measure to make the troops within less vulnerable to missile fire in a siege. This style becomes increasingly common in the mid-4th century. Finally, by the 5th century, we start to see the sites of Roman forts changing too, 
especially in the western part of the empire, with forts moving from lowland positions along major roadways for rapid response to hilltop sites that were less convenient for movement but easier to defend. In the east, a lot of the focus shifts to key heavily fortified cities, essentially fortress cities, like Nisibis, modern Nusaban, Amida, Singara, and Dara. We'll talk a bit more about how a heavily fortified late Roman city might be protected in the next post. Image. Diagram of the Roman Fort at Visegrad. Image description. Via Wikipedia. A smaller Roman fort at Visegrad. Reflective of late 4th century trends in Roman fort design. Notice the projecting towers on the corners, which allowed the defenders to shoot missiles all the way down the walls. End of image description. In short, Roman forts in this late period are being designed with the ability to resist either serious assaults or prolonged sieges. This, in part, reflects a lack of confidence that the Romans could always count on being able to immediately force a field battle they could win. While Roman armies retained the edge through most of this period, the main field armies were increasingly concentrated around the emperors, and so might be many days, weeks, or even months away when an incursion occurred. Local forces had to respond elastically to delay the incursion much longer than before until that army could arrive. Now, of course, the downside to a focus like this on single-site defense, point defense in its most basic form, is that the enemy army is given much more freedom to move around the countryside and wreck things, where they would have been engaged in the older observe channel respond defense system much more quickly. Lutwak terms this preclusive defense, but it isn't quite that preclusive. The frontier is never a hard border. But of course, the entire reason you are doing this is that the shifting security situation means you can no longer be confident in winning the decisive engagement that the observe, channel, respond, defense system is designed for. You need to delay longer to concentrate forces more significantly to get a favorable outcome. Single site defenses can do this for reasons we've actually already discussed. Because the army in the fort remains an active threat, the enemy cannot generally just bypass them without compromising their own logistics, either their supply lines or foraging ability. Consequently, while some forts can be bypassed, they cannot all be bypassed. A lesson, in fact, that the Emperor Julian would fail to learn, leading to disaster for his army and his own death. And so the enemy, while they can damage the immediate environment, cannot proceed out of the frontier zone and into the true interior without taking some of these forts, which in turn will slow them down long enough for a major field army to arrive and, in theory, offer battle on favorable terms. While it is easy to discount these shifts as just part of the failure of the Roman Empire, and we'll come back to this idea, often presented in the form of a misquotation of George S. Patton, that, quote, fixed fortifications are monuments to the stupidity of man, end quote. Though what he actually said was merely that the Maginot Line was such. They contribute meaningfully to the Roman ability to hold on to a vast empire in an increasingly more challenging security environment. At pretty much all stages of its development, Roman fortification on the frontiers was designed to allow the Romans to maintain their territorial control with an economy of force precisely because the Roman Empire could not afford to maintain overwhelming force everywhere on its vast perimeter. Rome wasn't alone in deploying that kind of defensive policy. At any given point, the northern frontier of China was guarded on much the same principles. The need to hold a frontier line with an economy of force because no state 
can afford to have overwhelming force everywhere. In both cases, the need for defense was motivated, in no small part, by the impossibility of further offensive. In the Roman case, further extension of the limes would simply create more territory to defend without actually creating more revenue with which to defend it. This is why the Roman acquisition of Dacia and much of Britain were likely ill-conceived, but then both operations were politically motivated in no small part. While in the Chinese case, the logistics of the steppe largely prohibited further expansion, this Roman system, combining local, single-site defenses, which included a proliferation of walled towns as the population centers of the Western Empire frantically rebuilt their walls, with concentrated, mobile field armies, really only began to fail after the Battle of Adrianople, 378, where, to be clear, the fortification system worked fine. The error came from the Emperor Valens' stupid decision to attack before his co-Emperor Gratian could arrive with reinforcements. Valens was eager to get all of the credit, and so he takes all of the blame. Next time, we'll actually begin to turn to what I suspect you all had in mind when I started writing this. Point defenses, aiming to defend an individual town or residence. Read Castles and Walled Cities, and how they could be structured to resist attack in the pre-gunpowder era, and we'll get into the function of curtain walls, outworks, towers, citadels, and so on. This has been a recording from a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux, recorded by myself, A Great Divorce, for accessibility and sharing purposes. If you enjoyed this content and wish to engage with it or support Brett, please check the description for links to the original post on his blog, his Twitter, and his Patreon. I highly encourage you to share, support, and engage with his works on any and all platforms if you are so inclined. If you wish to support me, please do remember to like, share, and subscribe to this or any other content here that you enjoy. Thank you so much for listening.